Good afternoon. I have the pleasure of spending two months with today's speaker, Jim Ayala, interning for Hybrid Social Solutions during the summer of 2013. Jim was born in Manila, Philippines, the second of five children. When he was 14, on his deathbed, his father wished three things for his children. One, to get a good education. Two, to take care of their mother. And three, to return to the Philippines to help in their development. Attaining a BS in economics from Princeton and an MBA from Harvard, being the only Filipino to ever be elected to McKinsey's Global Partnership, becoming the CEO of Ayala Land, the largest property development company in the Philippines, founding Hybrid Social Solutions, an enterprise which partners with socially oriented organizations on the ground in order to distribute their solar products to rural communities and named Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year and Social Entrepreneur of the Year, as well as Schwab's Foundation's 24 World Social Entrepreneurs. Looking down on him today, Jim's father would certainly be proud. But don't let all his great accomplishments intimidate you. During my time in the Philippines, I also saw Jim as a great mentor, father, and friend, with an even greater affinity for desserts always taking his afternoon snack break and boasting that he only ate half the dessert, only to eat half of the half and half of the half and so on until the dessert was gone. A charismatic presence, always willing to go out of his way to help where he can and make his community a better place. Jim is a prime example of what it means to be a true change maker. Please welcome Jim Ayala to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. Thank you so much, Millie. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be back at Claremont and to see so many familiar faces, starting with Millie. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that um, John Peranda is here. Uh, because uh, two and a half years ago, when I first arrived as a, 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 a parent, uh, my son Gabriel is a junior, um, one of the first people that we met was John, um, who introduced me to Pamela, <laughs> um, who introduced me to Sarah, uh, which is the reason why I'm here. So, I'm, uh, <laughs> so it's really just delightful to, to be among uh, friends um, and to see this um, community growing. Um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, you are all part of a quiet revolution that's going on, uh, and it's the social business revolution, uh, which has been evolving um, you know, over the last few years from when I first came and we first had this discussion here. So I'm just delighted how this has taken root here uh, at CMC. Uh, I'm delighted that you're now one of the Ashoka Changemaker campuses. Uh, and um, I hope through this speech today uh, that I might uh, get a few more of you to enlist uh, and to, to, to join me in, in what we're doing. Um, I've entitled this uh, talk, Scaling Social Business um, to Save the World. Um, we all want uh, to save the world, uh, and God knows that uh, there's a lot of issues that, that we need to, uh, to address. Uh, and I, I think if we continue doing what we're doing, uh, we all know that we're not kind of on, on the right path. Uh, if we look at things from a planet standpoint and we look at climate change, um, we know that uh, continuing to have uh, the footprint that we have is, is only get, gonna get us into more trouble. I'm, uh, this, is this, this is very close to home for us because in the Philippines last year, we got hit by Typhoon Haiyan which was the strongest typhoon in the history of the world. Uh, and we were getting um, winds at over 300 kilometers an hour. Um, and one of the things that's happening is that the um, ocean east of the Philippines where typhoons spawn, it's just getting warmer, which means there's more energy and so we've got more frequent and larger typhoons. In the last three years, we've had three supposedly once in 100 year typhoons, and we've had one every year. 
Um, so th these are just getting stronger and you know, with all of the consequent um, displacement and, and challenges that happen. So, you know, and a lot of this, um, scientists are still debating, but you know, for us, we're definitely on the receiving end of this and, and it's, it's something that needs to change. Uh, we also see that even in this day and age that there are many unsolved social problems, uh, whether it's from, you know, going from nutrition or education or uh, in my sector, uh, energy, poverty, uh, water. Um, you know, there are many, many issues out there that are still not solved where you have about a third of humanity living in, in situations that in this day and age are just unacceptable. And of course, that creates a lot of uh, social tension. Um, and you know, I think uh, what I've been seeing on campus a lot and just in the workforce in general is that you know, people are increasingly looking for more meaning in, you know, in their careers and what they choose to spend the majority of their waking energy on. So they're, they're looking for more meaning and are, are asking, isn't there a better way? You know, is, do I have to be a slave <laughs> to earn money and then you know, and, and, and do everything else on the side. So I, I think um, you know, we all know that um, we need changes in the paradigm and, and I'm happy you know, to, to be part of the social business revolution, which I, I think is a potential solution to some of these issues. Uh, let me just spend a, a few minutes to just describe what I mean by social business. Uh, a social business is a business uh, whose mission is fundamentally to solve a problem of the poor. Um, and so it's, it's, you, we are, you, you do have to make money, but uh, fundamentally the mission is to, to meet the needs of the poor. Um, the way that a social business helps, uh, the way that the social business engages with the bottom of the pyramid, is very much with a mindset of empowerment. It's about helping people to help themselves to move um, along a development ladder uh, so that they will, on their own steam, eventually get out of poverty. Um, I think those of us here who have kids and our parents uh, know that we love our kids to death and we would give them everything if we could, but you know, we also know that if we spoiled them and gave them everything, by the time they're 50 years old, they're still living at home asking for an allowance, right? And so, you know, so how do, we, how do we get the poor you know, to no longer be dependent forever, but to, to get out of poverty? It's, essentially, it's about development, but that development needs to start with empowerment. And so I think that's a um, very important philosophy, which is very different from many of the traditional paradigms, which have been about aid and charity, uh, you know, which has a, a role and is important, but you know, needs to, go, to move beyond that. Uh, so social businesses are about empowerment when we work with the people we're trying to help. And the mindset is very much around system change. You know, things are not working, we need to make a change, and that change needs to be systemic. Um, and, and therein lies the challenge. I mean, if you're trying to change the whole system, uh, that's an enormous amount of work. And when you're working, for example, in my country, uh, in a place where the system is broken, uh, where government doesn't function, you know, and, and there's a lot of corruption and other factors. It's very hard to change the system, but at the end, uh, that's what social businesses are trying to do. Um, the unifying organization uh, in order to do this is to work with other organizations to enlist them so that you start to create an ecosystem of partners that are working together against this particular problem that you've chosen. Uh, and I, I hear that later on in, the, in, in Sarah's class on leading social innovation, uh, the different students are making pitches about their, their passions and trying to get other folks interested in what they're doing. Um, and so this very much is, the, is, the, is what uh, social businesses try to do. We don't try to solve everything by ourselves. We try to enlist other people, but how do you get people to work together, uh, we um, put a lot of emphasis on creating what we call a hybrid value chain, uh, which is a concept developed by Ashoka and Hystra. 
Um, and um, it's a value chain, that's a, it's a hybrid in the sense that it's the combination of social and commercial and people working together where everyone in the chain uh, sees value. So there's everyone adds value, everyone sees value, so therefore everyone continues doing what they're doing and pretty soon you get a bigger and bigger ecosystem going. Uh, and so that's very much kind of the unifying organization for different people working on the problem. Uh, and there are a number of um, aspects uh, that, that the overall approach would be what we would call market-based. Um, and many problems can be solved uh, through a market-based approach, not all of them. There are definitely limitations, uh, but we would say that you know, there's a lot more that can be done in this, on this side because in general, businesses have been on the sidelines of these issues. Businesses have left it to NGOs and left it to government to solve these problems. But in reality, there are many, many things that businesses can do. Uh, but some of the hallmarks of the market-based approach in this sector is very much about innovations which are customer-centric, so therefore very much understanding the needs um, of the poor, um, where there's a lot of need to solve the barriers that are preventing these innovations from scaling. Um, some of the barriers would be things like last mile distribution, getting that product installed in a very remote island, for example, uh, uh, overcoming customer trust issues where you're asking somebody to spend one year of salary on this new innovation that they've never seen before. Um, financing. Um, uh, these are some of the highest return on investment products that people can make. They're, they're, you know, the, normally our products, people get a two, after buying it, they pay it back in two to three months. So they're very good return on investment, but they need financing in order to afford this, and who's gonna lend money to a poor fisherman? Uh, and finally, if, if they buy these larger items that are, uh, you know, that break, they need, you need service. You wouldn't buy a car or a washing machine if you couldn't get it fixed, right? You don't expect it to break often, but when it does break, you need to get it fixed. So these are some of the barriers that social businesses have to solve. Um, and um, uh, the mindset is that we need to be financially sustainable. Um, we're, we're not there to maximize profit, but profit is like gasoline. Uh, you need gas in your tank in order to keep going. Uh, you know, it doesn't define my journey, uh, but it's necessary and essential. And so uh, many folks in the nonprofit sector are living from grant to grant or donation to don donation. And, you know, when there's no money coming in, you know, all the work stops. And so uh, there's not, what I can say is there's not enough grant money and donation money to solve the problems we're talking about. So we need to find a way for the money to keep coming in so that you're financially sustainable. We have to pay a lot of attention to environmental sustainability, of course. And finally, if you've got something going, you need strategies that you can actually take that good idea and replicate it and scale it. And I'll talk a lot about that today. Uh, but because there are literally thousands and thousands of fantastic social enterprises, but m most of them have not figured out how to scale. Um, and so to me, that's really the big tragedy here is that the solutions exist, but they're not getting into the hands of the people that need it. So how do we change that situation? Um, I'll, I'll just uh, put in this chart, uh, which came from uh, Ashoka, to, uh, because this is very critical uh, as an underpinning to what I'll discuss. But the notion of the hybrid value chain is that you've got the, the bottom of the pyramid, the people that we're trying to help, and there's mainstream businesses who, one way to think about the mainstream business is it's a fantastic Xerox machine. If Nestle found a great shampoo or product in the Philippines and they wanted to roll it out across the world, they could do that in two years and that product would get rolled out. Now, where are those Fantastic ideas, they're with social businesses, they're with social entrepreneurs, but you know, Nestle hasn't picked those up yet. Or, you know, and many companies are starting this, but it just system, systemically hasn't been happening. So, so we need to engage business, we need to engage um, you know, the poor, we need to engage the social businesses, whether they're a um, social enterprise or a, uh, an, an NGO or a civil society organization. And of course, government has a very critical role, uh, especially to create an enabling environment. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the value chain. 
So in order to, to illustrate this, I wanted to come a bit, maybe just to, to talk about from my own personal experience, come back to what we're doing to go through some of the aspects of uh, what I just talked about. Um, uh, my organization is actually a network, uh, and we call it the hybrid network. Uh, and our mission uh, is to empower communities through sol solar energy. We're very much trying to solve issues around energy poverty in rural areas in the Philippines. Uh, and our target is all off-grid villages, and there's about 50,000 villages that we're trying to hit. Uh, and we want them to have access to solar energy. Uh, and we go in, in with an empowerment uh, approach, and we leverage both market and ph philanthropic forces. Um, I mentioned that uh, when we talk about being market-based, we need to start with the customer. Um, and so we're very particular about understanding what customers need and then coming up with technologies that meet their needs. Um, so think of a rural household uh, in a village or up in the mountains. Um, we have in the Philippines, uh, it's, it's the women doing the chores at home still. Uh, so they need light, they need um, heating, they need different products. So we have products for the home. Um, people use our products for their livelihood. Uh, our customers tend to be fishermen or farmers. So farmers uh, use our products to scare pests. Uh, there might, um, we, if you're growing corn in the mountains, one of your big problems are wild pigs. And the wild pigs come in and they root up your corn and it's not unusual that you, you lose 40 to 50% of your corn. And they come in at night. So you need to be able to guard your crops when they're ripe uh, and so they go out with our flashlights and drive away pigs. Uh, we have one group that increased their, their revenue by 30% uh, by doing this. Uh, fishermen uh, go out at night and they use kerosene lights to attract squid and anchovies. And so you, they put out the light and the fish come. Uh, and what's interesting is that they spend about 30% of their revenue goes to pay for the kerosene. So whatever they catch, 30% is going to the kerosene. Of course, you also have to pay for the gasoline. You have to pay for uh, your crew. You got to pay for food. You got to pay for ice. Uh, they, they spend a lot of money buying ice uh, and cigarettes, right? So that's their budget. And by the end, by the end of the, the month, they, have no, they spent a lot of money, but they, they don't have any money left. So they spend about $7 a day on kerosene to catch fish, and that's about $200 per month. But by the end of the month, they don't have any money. So we've got solar products that cost about $200, which they can use um, to catch fish. And so they're now saving that, 700, that $7 per day um, uh, doing that. So that now can go to other more productive things. Uh, of course, um, uh, uh, one of the key priorities for the poor is for their children to be educated. Uh, and they, they put a lot of emphasis in education. And uh, it's very hard to study at night when you have no light. Uh, so uh, a lot of moms buy our products so that their children can study. So we've got products, uh, study lights for kids. Uh, and when it comes to community um, uh, activities, uh, one of the big ones would be health workers. Uh, and they, we have special products for health workers so that they can go and do home deliveries. For example, when a, there's a baby being born, a midwife will, will use our products uh, instead of, um, usually they might be using their cell phone in between their teeth you know, to catch the baby. Uh, and when the cell phone runs out of light, if it's a long labor, then, you know, you might have a candle. So very, very difficult. So we've got heaps of technology uh, which are very specific to, to our customers. Uh, and the key thing with them is that you have to be able to convince them that there's immediate impact. Uh, and what, uh, what we see, uh, based on our research, is that they save about $10 uh, per month on energy, so less spending on kerosene less spending on charging your cell phone. All of our customers, they have no electricity, but they all have cell phones. And so how do they charge their cell phones? They have to walk to the, to the town and they pay money to charge their phone. And they'll do that three times a week. Um, so they save money on that. Uh, but more interestingly is that they actually, their, their income increases. Uh, with more time and more light, if you're making baskets, you can make more baskets. Uh, I already talked to you about how a fisherman or a farmer can make, uh, make more money. Uh, so we see a $40 increase on an average household income of about $150. So it's over 25% increase by having 
solar lights. And the children study more. Um, we have one customer whose four children all became honor students. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, with, with her solar lights. And of course, you feel safer and healthier. Uh, you're no longer uh, inhaling fumes. Uh, our, our customers cough 56% less. Uh, and uh, you don't have any more fires. 40% of our customers have had their, a house burn or a child hurt. So you're living in a constant state of fear by having candles around the house. So these are some of the things that, that motivate people to actually purchase. Now, how do we get it to them? The, uh, these people are living in very remote places. Uh, and so we talked earlier about the notion of a hybrid value chain. So in our case, we've got product innovators who are making products specifically for catching fish, for example. Uh, we then are, we are a distributor, so we bring it in and we distribute it. We then have partners in the communities that will do the maintenance and the financing uh, and so that eventually the person gets it. So we, we, try to, we do this uh, into every village. And as I mentioned, there's 50,000 villages. So it's a real challenge to then take this program and then replicate it so that we can continue it uh, in every village. Um, in order to do this, we've, got, um, we've built an ecosystem of suppliers and solar capability. The solar capability uh, does sourcing and also does financing. Uh, the Sun Connect, for example, is, an, is a cooperative that we set up in Germany that takes money from retired German people. You get paid 3% interest and the money gets invested in financing uh, poor people, uh, uh, solar equipment to poor people. So that's what's enabled us to order equipment because most suppliers say, well, as soon as you, we ship it, you have to pay us in full. And so instead of paying them in full, we get a loan from Sun Connect. So the supplier gets paid in full, and then we can pay over time uh, at a reasonable interest rate. Uh, so, we, and so we have a whole network that works with us to bring, it, bring our products to end users, and we have several types of distribution partners. We have channel partners in the communities. We also do institutional sales to larger organizations working in these communities. And we've started going direct to customers with a direct sales force now, and we call these uh, sales ladies solutionistas. Filipinas love to be fashionistas. <laughs> uh, so we're trying, you know, not what, but you know, when, when I get together with our salespeople and, and we're doing forums and we're talking about uh, what they do, the part where they start crying, it's not when they say that they're making more money, it's the part where they say, you know, now I feel useful. Now I feel like I'm doing something meaningful. I'm helping my, I'm helping my, uh, my neighbors. Um, so we, we, we've created a whole um, distribution network to reach end users. Um, and so there are actually, what we found is that we've had to come up with several different pathways. When Millie was working with us, we were focused on pathway one, uh, which basically works with uh, community partners um, and these are generally uh, very socially oriented partners. Uh, and we, we have to train them on how to do a solar program. Uh, we, we do launches and we show them how to sell. Uh, we then uh, get, train them on how, on how to do repairs and warranties. And they have to integrate it into what they're already doing. It might be a microfinance organization, which is basically a bank. So for them now to sell solar and maintain solar systems is a whole new line of business for them. So we train them to do that. And then once it's working in one branch, we then can expand to the next branch and the next branch. So that's kind of how we sell to end users. Uh, and you know, if you just take those bubbles, that's, those are branches of one of our partners. So our partners have hundreds of branches. So we're very busy making it work in one or two branches. And then from there, giving them the confidence to replicate it to additional branches. Um, Another pathway that we found to be quite important is our foundation. What we found is not all of the needs in a village can be met by customers buying equipment. Uh, we have schools, we have clinics uh, in, these, in these villages. And so we had to come up with programs that actually met the energy needs of these organizations. And either the public schools go through a bidding process and buy our products where they have no money and it's a corrupt bidding process, or 
the foundation go, approaches a company and says, would you like to sponsor a school? <laughs> and so the, the money comes through dona the donations, but the foundation then purchases the equipment from us. So as a company supplying products, we're, we're made whole, and then the foundation then works with schools and clinics and relief organizations to meet uh, a range of other needs. So through the foundation, what we've come up with now are several programs where systemically we're hitting uh, the needs uh, across the whole country. There are, for example, 8,000 schools in the Philippines with no electricity. We've recently signed a MOA with the Secretary of Education to take our education program across all 8,000 schools. Uh, we're doing something similar in birthing centers. There are 2,000 birthing centers with no electricity and no refrigeration. Um, so you know, if, if, if you just imagine uh, trying to attend to a birth and there's no light, and after the woman gives birth, she's having a hemorrhage, and you don't have the medicine, which needs to be refrigerated in order to address it, now you understand why hemorrhage is the number one cause of maternal mortality. And all you need to do is a simple injection of a medicine that needs to be refrigerated. So we're working to put lights and refrigeration in birthing centers. Um, after the big typhoon, we uh, found that there are many ways that lighting and communications and electricity are critical, whether it's in the early stages of search and rescue, when you're looking for people in, 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 you know, that have been swept away by floods, for example, or as you get into the temporary phase, where you have temporary medical tents or evacuation centers or soup kitchens, because you have all of these displaced people. So that all needs lighting, as you can imagine. Um, and then once you get into the more permanent stage and you're turning over new homes, uh, we're finding now that the new homes are being turned over, people are not moving in because there's no light in their homes. So we're putting lights, solar lights into these, into these homes. So there's a lot of work that, that we do. Uh, foundation led, so the money comes from charity, but then uh, it gets spent to purchase the solar equipment. I'll just do a little bit of a dive into the Light for Education program to give you a bit of, bit of a sense for the kind of approach that we take because we do consider the foundation to be a social enterprise as well. Uh, we're meeting two needs. One need is there's no light at home so people can't study. The other need is there's no light at school. So it's hard to do work at the school without any electricity. So at home you can't study and it's also bad for health. And our solution is what we call a solar library. So a solar library is, uh, let's say, a, a school of 200 kids. We'll have 200 small solar reading lights, uh, which the children can, so which are donated to the school, and the school becomes the custodian. So we train a solar librarian to take care of the collection, and then children can check out lights like they would check out a book, and they bring it home for a week. And after a week, they need to return the light, and the custodian then checks it in and makes sure that the light's okay. Um, and there's a small fee that's collected, which goes to maintenance. And that fee is collected by the PTA. So what you find here is that the, the social contract that we've set up between us, the school, and the families is that we'll provide it. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll get the funding, and we'll provide it. The school is in charge of, is, is the custodian, and has to make sure that that collection five years from now will be all complete and everything will be working. So they got custodianship, they got maintenance, and the families, basically their job is to pay for maintenance. They're getting to use it, they have a lot of benefits, so they come up with the maintenance. Now they're poor, how can they afford five pesos? Well, it's per week, it's because they're spending 10 pesos per day on their current lighting. So this is an 83% savings. So the children study more, they, uh, they, they get better grades, they save money, they cough less, and, and everyone feels safer. So this is something that uh, is working quite well, and we're now franchising this out to other organizations, other foundations to do it. And I hope Alice Chang will be able to help me this summer, because we've got a really good program, but it's one thing to have a good program, it's another thing to say, I've got all the manuals, I've got all the kits, I've got all the instructions, and we can now franchise this out and replicate it. Now, the other thing that happens in schools is, is that they don't have electricity in, in the school itself, and so classrooms can be quite dim. 
There's no mul multimedia being used in class, no computers, and the teachers who sleep at the school, because these are quite remote schools, so teachers travel from towns and sleep at the school Monday to Friday, they have no light, they cannot do their work, they cannot uh, charge their phones. Uh, so, you know, a lot of challenges, and so we've got um, a solution that we call a solar charging station. Uh, this is a solar suitcase manufactured out of Berkeley. I was at We Care Solar last night at Berkeley, um, and uh, these suitcases, uh, the, the concept is you have a very rugged waterproof case and you have all your solar panels and your battery and your lights and all your equipment in a suitcase. I put it on the back of a mule. You know, we go up the mountain, it's raining, you know, it gets there and we install it. Once you have it, it powers overhead lights. You've got tablets and phones being charged. Uh, you can use laptops, lapel mics, cameras, projectors. We have a um, LED projector that charges off of this, DVD players, sound system, etc. Uh, and so it totally transforms the kind of education that can be delivered um, in these classrooms. As an interesting aside, this particular suitcase is being built in, the, in America in high schools. Uh, so the company sells a kit, it's in 800 pieces, <laughs> and uh, children then, a school purchases it, it gets taught in a class, and so you learn, the children learn about STEM. They learn about solar, renewable, electricity, math, etc. They build it, they learn about where it's going to go. So in, in, in our case, they learned about the Philippines. So it's also so social studies, international social studies. And they had to raise money to buy the kit. So there's a, you know, you're also giving back. So it's STEM and international social studies and service all rolled in one. And we're getting a steady supply of 10 of these suitcases per month because we've signed up a bunch of schools to build these things. And um, so especially Catholic schools like the Philippines because we have lots of Catholics uh, in, in the Philippines. The Pope was just in the Philippines. Um, ironically, he went to Tacloban. One of his main reasons to go was to go to Tacloban, which is the place that got hit really hard. While he was there, there was a typhoon. Uh, and you know th they had to leave, uh, cut their trip short because of this typhoon. So you, you see kind of how climate change is, is affecting us. And so this, this kind of equipment uh, is very helpful. Uh, in schools, we have other solutions, solar classrooms, solar computer labs, solar water pumps. We've also found that it's very important to engage the PTA. Uh, one of the things uh, that happened was, uh, remember I said the solar library, the PTA was collecting the money. Because teachers aren't allowed to handle money, so it was the PTA collecting the money. And pretty soon the PTA started saying, you know, we're collecting all of this money, can we keep a percentage for our projects? Um, and then we said, well, in order to do that, you'd have to raise the fees. Uh, and the other thing that was happening was the community, because we had these solar suitcases in the school, they all started charging their cell phones at school. And the solar suitcases are in the bedrooms of the teachers, and so they were sort of somehow invading the teacher space in order to charge their phones, and you can't say no. So what we came up with is we said, you know, why don't we donate small charging centers to the PTA? And so now the PTA operates a charging station, the community charges at the PTA community charging station and pays a fee in order to do that. So the first uh, 10 pesos of, uh, of the day goes to a battery fund so for the solar suitcases to eventually replace the battery and then the rest of the money can be kept by the PTA. So these are the types of things that um, we've been doing. We now found that they're very interested in ice. None of these villages have ice. Um, and so Filipinos love, as Millie said, we love dessert, so we have lots of ice candy and, you know, kind of uh, I icy type stuff. Um, and so uh, we, uh, so they were asking, do, do you have uh, solar freezers? Uh, and we do because of the clinics. And so we were going to introduce it, and we, at first we were going to, we were thinking that the PTA would then be able to sell cold drinks and cold, you know, kind of Slurpees and that kind of stuff. But then we realized that if they did that, it would hurt the existing Sari Sari stores selling soft drinks. And so what we ended up with was the PTA, their job is to sell ice. So they're basically an ice factory. All the stores come and buy ice. The PTA only needs to assign somebody for an hour. You don't need somebody to man the store the whole time, which is a problem. So they sell out in an hour, and then all the stores now have ice. And so in that way, everyone is, is happy. So th these are the, 
the ways that we engage um, in the community to empower it and kind of keep going. I'll show a quick video uh, of some of our summer interns who went over to this village. I'll show you what a school looks like. We're walking uh, to the village. This is my daughter jumping over the stream. So you, that's just to give you a picture for how we do our Light for Education program. So uh, a third pathway that we do is we take programs like that and we then franchise it out. So One Million Lights, for example, is a Palo Alto-based uh, NGO and they've taken on the Solar Library Project and they've started, uh, they've signed up 150 schools where they're gonna take the Solar Library Project. So we've trained them on how to do that and they're buying all their lights from our social enterprise. But we have other customers, people like Habitat, who are turning over homes in unelectrified areas after the typhoon. And what we've found is that people don't move in when there's no light. Um, and so they've now started incorporating into their normal fundraising model. They just add 5% and then those homes now have solar lights. Uh, so that's coming. Uh, we have electric cooperatives in all of these areas because these, these, French, these, are, these, these islands or these towns are part of somebody's electricity franchise area. So we've been working with them on programs where the electric cooperative owns the equipment and puts it in people's homes. So we've got a whole range of programs and pathways to reach the market uh, that we're serving. So the sequence uh, that we generally follow is we, we need to understand the needs we're trying to serve. We need to then pilot appropriate technologies and approaches and make sure it's effective. Once it's effective, like our solar library we know is quite effective, we then need to make it easy to replicate. So that's what Alice hopefully will be working on is how do we take that and make it really easy to replicate. And once you've got something that you can really replicate, then you raise them a lot of money and then you scale up and you, you, you hire people and, and you can then uh, you know, go to, to many, many villages. Everyone wants to do the end part but you can't do that unless you go through steps one, two, and three. Otherwise, you 
you, you hire lots of people, you're burning cash, and pretty soon you run out of money, uh, and the wheels fall off. So that's kind of a sense for how we work. Uh, you also need to make sure that you're putting a lot of emphasis on the financial model. Uh, this is just a very quick way to say that at the end, um, our main model is we have salespeople selling, and each person needs to sell a certain number of units per day in order to make uh, the model work. Uh, and so by making sure you hit those ratios, uh, you, you, you go from something that's marginal to something that's quite profitable. Uh, and so we've been working very hard to make sure that we're hitting the operating ratios that we need in order to achieve that profitability. Again, I cannot scale up if each individual salesman is losing money. I just have a bigger problem. So we got to make it really work at this level, and then from there you can scale. Uh, and manage cash, not just profitability, but cash flow as well. Uh, last, last bit uh, is about the culture uh, that we've made it a point to build from the beginning. Uh, and the way that uh, we like to call it, uh, describe ourselves, the culture, is it's Mother Teresa meets the Marines. Now, in the Philippines, when I started asking young people about Mother Teresa, they didn't know who she was. <laughs> uh, I hope you guys know who Mother Teresa is, but she's really a symbol for compassion, who went to live with the poor in Calcutta, the people that she's trying to help. So we go and we live with them and we love them and we, we work with them. We spend a lot of time you know, with them. That's why we're doing what we're doing. But at the same time, you gotta be tough and professional and deliver in difficult situations like the Marines. Uh, so that's kind of how uh, we, we describe ourselves. And so our organization has a number of important hallmarks which tend to be very similar with other social businesses. Uh, we talked a little bit about the purpose, you know, the need for compassion, you know, the empowerment approach, uh, some of the other things that I, I, I mentioned a while ago. So at the end, what we're trying to do in the Philippines is actually to build an off-grid solar industry. Uh, the traditional approach has been to electrify people, let's extend the electricity grid, but it's just not gonna happen because it's too many places, too far, too remote, too much money. And so rather than trying to beat an old horse to death, come up, let's use new products and new approaches. It's a little bit like cell phones. I mean, all of our customers have cell phones, and you don't see any NGOs going and doing cell phones. It's, it was the market that, that worked. And so it's the same thing with electricity. You no longer have to be tied to a landline, you know, uh, like a phone. You no longer have to be tied to a, a, the electricity grid. You can have a standalone power and, and one power source for each of the things that you need. So we're trying to uplift individuals and their, their families uh, you help hopefully use that to catalyze rural development. You cannot develop, you cannot develop without energy. Uh, we're, we're very much trying to empower people to achieve their full potential. Uh, and by doing so, hopefully kind of get our whole country to move up. So that's um, a quick summary of social business. Mission to solve a social problem, engagement through empowerment. Mindset is about making a systemic change, not just accepting the way things are. Um, organizing around the hybrid value chain because you need everyone else to work together with you and a market-based approach. So what's been great to see in this quiet revolution is that charities and uh, foundations have been moving more towards being more strategic or more venture-oriented or so even so have social enterprise approaches and companies are moving from just CSR to saying, how do we create shared value? How do we be more inclusive? And I think that's all kind of converging in what I would call social business. So what's my advice for you? Does anyone know what movie this is from? Matrix, you guys remember that part when, when uh, uh, Morpheus was going to Neo and saying, you can take the blue pill and then you'll go back to sleep and you'll never know that you're living in a fabricated world. Or you can take the red pill and you know, you can, that'll be real. You know, it's, it'll be an adventure, who knows what's gonna happen, but that's real. But once you do that, there's no turning back. So I would really love if you guys uh, took the red pill. <laughs> uh, and uh, in order to do this, some practical advice, especially those who are looking for jobs and and all that is, you know, you get involved in, in, in this. Uh, you can, st many of you have started your own organizations. That's great if you can. 
Uh, I would really encourage you to work with um, social enterprises in emerging markets so you really understand how things work on the ground. Uh, and it's fantastic that um, CMC uh, actually provides stipends uh, for you guys to work in emerging markets. Uh, Millie, we, we benefited a lot from Millie joining us. Uh, we are hiring this summer, by the way, uh, and I'm having an info session later on this. Uh, but do get experience in traditional business because what you find is to do everything that we're talking about, you have to know about marketing, about distribution, logistics, financing. So it's really important to get that. Try to work in organizations that are more inclined um, to do this. So it could be a charity, it could be um, a company, uh, but try to work with the ones who are moving up towards that social business. Uh, build your network. Your network will be very important. The CMC network is very powerful. Uh, save your money because you'll need it. <laughs> Uh, if you enter this space, uh, it's, you know, it's a start, these are startups, these are, you know, it's a long road to hoe. Um, but most importantly, find your purpose. Find the thing that, you know, makes you tick, the, the thing that you want to devote, you know, the majority of your time and energy to. Uh, and if you know that, you know, then it's easier to find the opportunities. It's easier, easier for you to let your network know what you're doing uh, because that network will come back to you if they know what, what, what you're going after. So, uh, social business joined the revolution. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions. I know some of you have to run, so anyone who has to run, please run. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for coming today. In your presentation, you had quite a lot of metrics, mm -hmm. whether that was how much your customers were saving, how much more the students were studying, and I was wondering how do you measure those, right. uh, especially that immediate impact when you don't have a lot of turnaround time? Right, well, we, um, uh, we actually, um, uh, am, you know, uh, most of our metrics have come from uh, people who are either on a Fulbright, uh, actually a lot of, uh, one of our, a lot of these metrics came from Jake Shual Berkey who was uh, from Pomona, he was a Fulbright, uh, and he worked with us for a year uh, and did a lot of surveys uh, before and after on, on the, 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 the metrics that we talked about. Um, so the key is to make it uh, very practical, it's not easy to, to get the data. Um, and so, you know, it's a balance between uh, getting very practical information. Uh, one of the things that we're doing now is uh, because you have cell phone technology, we can actually communicate by text and by phone. And one of our critical metrics is, will, are people willing to recommend the products to their neighbors? So, so we look at that net satisfaction score. Because what tends to happen is if they're not happy, let's say it broke and you weren't able to fix it, they spent money and then it broke, you know, then they tell their neighbors, oh, this thing is a dud, don't spend your money and pretty soon, you know, you're not selling anything in that village. Um, so we know uh, from some of these metrics that have been done by people like, like Jake, we, we also have uh, surveys and enumerators who come in. Uh, we know that once they have it, there's a lot of impact. So the next thing is, is it going well? Are, are people happy with the product? Are they recommending it to their neighbors? And that's generally an issue about making sure you have the service network in place. In fact, they're even happier when it breaks and you fix it, and then they say, wow, you know, we don't expect everything to work all the time, but when it breaks, it's fantastic that they were able to fix it, because that never happens. Hi, thank you for the wonderful insights. Um, my question is about the value chain and partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what are some of the challenges or barriers you face in reaching out to partners and creating those partnerships? And second, has it ever been the case that someone has said no to becoming a partner with you, and what's been their rationale behind that? Yeah, um, I guess the you know the the main I would say the main challenge is to make it work for the partner um, at the time you know at, at the particular geography and at the time you know that they want to participate. So kind of getting the value added and the geography and the timing all working is quite important uh, because they might be really interested in helping, but if I can't support it, you know, then we can't start, 
right? Or we, we, we might be interested in starting, but then they might say, well, we have other priorities at this time. And so it's kind of getting the alignment so that, you know, because we're, we're all different organizations who are all di doing different things. We all happen to care about this problem, but it's not anyone's main line, really. And so kind of getting people to work together uh, and then have a successful experience is really important. So what we tend to do is we, we go and, you know, we'll go to the board of an organization and we'll say, you know, do you guys need lighting and electricity? And if we've chosen the area properly, they'll say, of course we do because we, we have all of these problems. And then we'll say, well, why don't you guys, we, we, we have some solutions, why don't you try it and see if you guys would be interested. And so they then test it out. And if they're interested, we say, let's do a pilot. And if the pilot is successful, we then say, why don't we do this as a full-on program? So you, you kind of have to go through that whole process for this to really take root. Um, so now do that with hundreds of partners. You know, that, that's our big challenge. I'd like to ask a, hi. Yeah. I'd like to ask a corollary question to, to the previous question. Uh, what would you say are the specific skill sets that you've used as a leader to develop those partnerships? Oh. <laughs> huh. That's a, uh, I guess I would say it's very situational uh, because uh, if you look at trying to, the, the, the value chain doesn't exist and so we're trying to build the value chain. So I'm an architect and there are many pieces, many pieces to this value chain. Uh, and, um, you know, I guess the, the first thing, the most important is to get people really uh, committed to, um, to the problem. Because if they, if they really want to solve the problem, then, you know, they'll, they'll be with you. But the, the, next prob the next issue is that everyone wants to solve the problem. Everyone wants peace. Everyone wants to address poverty. But everyone has a different idea on how to do it. So I think uh, trying to figure out who's going to be like-minded is quite important. Uh, there are many people in the charity sector, for example, that are very suspicious of organizations like ours who are actually making money from the poor. Uh, and so, you know, so, so we, we need people who share similar values. So that's a little bit, but once you discern that, I think, then they're saying, well, you know, can you give me a concrete uh, solution? You know, so that next skill set is to say, let's package everything together, get it organized so that when I have a partner who wants to participate, you know, it's kind of easy peasy because we, we've got this 10 step process and it's time bound and, and you know, and we can provide the support. Um, Sarah, you wanted to say something? Oh. I was going to take a shot at reframing what you okay. said. You. And what it, what it is is that you use yourself as an instrument. That is, as a leader, you're engaging, you're persuading, you're involving people. Yeah. And then you bring them in as part of your network, your, your set of stakeholders. And you work through them by empowering them. Yeah. So you really entrust empower in a way that uh, is a critical aspect of leadership. It's not about hanging on, but really giving it away right. to others to move it through. Yeah. Could I, is, is that, that feel yeah. right? And I, so I look at myself as an architect and, and, and then I have to figure out who are the people I want in and I'm very persuasive. <laughs> but at the end, it's not gonna continue unless it works, right? So the guys at the, the board always says yes. <laughs> Right, it's the guys at the, you know, kind of in the trenches that, you know, will have to, like if I'm approaching an, an MFI to introduce a solar program, it's extra work for the branch manager. So I need to make it work for the branch manager, which means that it's gonna help him with his numbers. You know, he gets, what he wants is more customers and more loans, but it's, it doesn't create too big a headache. What he doesn't like is people are not paying their loan because the thing broke, and then now he's got complaining customers not paying, you know, who are returning their broken lights, right? So you, you want to avoid that. So that, that's the real challenge. So it's, it's constantly problem solving all the different pieces and trying to be able to make it work remotely. Hi, sorry, I'm going to keep on asking questions until someone else. Thank you. Uh, raises their hand. In your presentation, you made a distinction between social enterprise and social business. What to you is the, is the difference between those two? Because a lot of the time, 
at least in the literature I'm reading, they're right. coupled together. They're synonymous. Yeah. I, I guess, um, you know, so, so, uh, very, very similar. Uh, I, I guess the, the, the operative difference is normally when you think of yourself as a business, uh, you, you're, you're there, to, you think about financial sustainability, you think about growth uh, and, you, and strategies to do that. So many of the social enterprises that, that I've found, they're, they're operating at a very small scale and they haven't really, they're not businesses yet. <laughs> they haven't graduated into being full-fledged businesses. Uh, so to me, a social business is kind of at, already has achieved some level of sustainability. Hi, thank you for coming to speak with us today. Um, so how, I was wondering how you really got the buy-in from the local community, because sometimes people are afraid of change. They're, yeah. They don't see the, the sudden impact and you know, paying more up front, saving more later. So how did you really overcome that barrier yeah. and get that buy-in from the community to make your enterprise successful? Yeah, that, that's, um, that's a really critical thing, because we can't operate without bu that buy-in. And I would say that our main strategy is to partner with organizations that are already working with the community and have built trust with the community. Um, so for example, when I go to a um, cooperative um, and, and you know, they'll, they, once they sign up for the program, you know, they then talk to their members and say, you guys, we've, we've signed up for this program. Um, we think this, these solar lights will be helpful trust us, it's, this is good for you, right? And then they turn around and look at us and they say, you better make sure it works, <laughs> right? And so that, that, and that's why we have to be Marines, right? You know, we cannot let our partners down. And in this sector in general, people have been let down a lot, right? And so I think that's one of our uh, main different, differentiating factors because there's lots of solar lights out there, right? A partner can buy lights from lots of other people, but most people are just suppliers. There's very few honest-to-goodness partners that will you know, do many things to make sure it's successful. And we add value in other ways because our foundation also comes in. So they'll say, okay, this program's going great, but you know, we've got this school, we've got this mosque, we've got you know, this clinic, can you help? And then we normally say, well, our company can't, but we do have a foundation partner, and why don't you apply, and then maybe they can help. So there, we, we provide a lot more value than just the product itself. Hi there. Um, I was struck about by your, I guess, the explanation about how the typhoon has changed the field and the sector, especially in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there are other countries uh, that you look to that have employed a similar model um, that have predated any of the natural disaster responses yeah. um, and that you look to um, in developing and expanding your model within the Philippines. Right. So, um, so you know, m many countries, um, you know, have similar needs, um, and what we, we really learned a lot from the international NGOs that came in, because these people, like say, say Doctors Without Borders or the Red Cross, I mean, they're working across the world on, on these types of things, and we found out, again, being very customer centric, we found out that they have very specific needs, and these needs vary by stage stage of the disaster and the recovery period. So we really, um, you know, through that uh, lens, we found out that there's this huge need and that we have an ability to help. Uh, so our solar suitcases, one of the things that we found was our solar suitcases, which we've been putting in a, as permanent deployments in remote birthing centers, that they're very, very good for temporary medical tents. Uh, and they're really, really good um, for the search and rescue when you go in on foot because you can't reach it by vehicle. So by definition, you have no power and lighting. Uh, and so we've actually now come up with a new product which you can put on a backpack and you can carry it in because it's hard to bring a suitcase. It's very different if it's on a backpack. And we've set up, one of the things that we noticed was during the the recovery period, um, everybody was looking for products that it's all sold out within the course of a week. And then the next round only came after about two months, which is two months too late. And so we came up with the need to have a stockpile of stuff on hand. So when a disaster does happen, it, it's there. But the question is who's going to finance that? And so we came up with the concept of a solar 
um, emergency solar uh, uh, lamp uh, stockpile, which is now being financed by charities who basically are commit, you know, who said we need to have a stockpile so that we have stocks available. And if there's no typhoon, we then take those stocks and sell it to our normal devices. Uh, we also came up with an emergency response repository of these suitcases where uh, organizations can come by and borrow our suitcases and bring it to their temporary deployments. So again, that's, that was financed by UBS, Optima Foundation. They, we, we, we pitched them and we said there's this need and they said, you know, we want to fund that. And so we now are doing that. And um, they're funding the initial thing, but we now need a business model to sustain it. So Haas, uh, Berkeley at the, at the business school, has an IBD program. And we've, we have three students for six months making our business plan. <laughs> um, so I guess we, every time we come up to a situation, we learn more. If there's a need, we try to, try to fill the need. Thank you, Jim. Isn't he awesome? We're so grateful that you could be with us today. In fact, he's with us all day, so he's gonna march over to my class and right. do things there and then recruit for interns. So